Defending the Earth, a dialogue between Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman, published by South End Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1991. Chapter 5 Second Thoughts of an Eco-Warrior Dave Foreman As an activist, my chosen task is to argue the case of non-human nature. I resolutely stand with John Muir on the side of the bears in the war industrial society has declared against the earth. Yet this does not mean that I hate human beings. It does not follow that I am unmoved by human suffering, economic injustice, imperialism, or abuses of human rights. While it is true that I don't identify myself as a leftist, for all the reasons I have mentioned, I do agree with much of the libertarian, democratic left on a large number of social concerns. I certainly recognize the need for increasing the connections between the left social concerns and my heartfelt and long-time ecological concerns. I have learned much from Murray Bookchin's criticisms and I acknowledge failings on my part in the past. I have often left unstated, and sometimes unexamined, the social components of problems like overpopulation, poverty, and famine while trying to discuss their biological nature. I have also not always made it clear that I abhor the human misery involved in such problems. I have been insensitive, albeit unintentionally and for that I humbly apologize. Let me give just two examples. In 1986, Professor Bill Deval, co-author of Deep Ecology interviewed me for the Australian magazine Simple Living. In that interview I made two statements I now regret, one on famine in Ethiopia and the other on Latin American immigration to the United States. For the first example I said, as part of a much longer discussion of famine and overpopulation, that the worst thing we could do in Ethiopia is to give aid, the best thing would be to just let nature seek its own balance, to let the people there just starve, the alternative is that you go in and save these half-dead children who never will live a whole life. Their development will be stunted. And what's going to happen in 10 years time is that twice as many people will suffer and die. On the question of immigration, I commented that letting the USA be an overflow valve for problems in Latin America is not solving a thing. It's just putting more pressure on the resources we have in the USA. Note. Dave Foreman interview by Bill Deval in Simple Living. End note. While I think it is unfortunate that these two passing comments have been used to deny the validity of everything I have to say and to paint me as a racist and fascist clone of David Duke, I do agree that these comments were both insensitive and simplistic. Taken out of the context of my larger concerns and writings, I can see how these remarks suggest a callous fortress America chauvinism on my part. However, in the first case I did not clearly say what I really meant and, in the second, I now reject some of what I did mean at the time. Indeed, after listening carefully to the criticism I've received, I have rethought and modified my opinion on illegal immigration. While I still believe that massive and unlimited immigration into any country is a serious problem, I do not support beefing up the Border Patrol and the other agencies that try to keep Latin Americans out of this country. I do not think that this is a realistic or ethical response to the underlying problem. As I said earlier, I have long been in deep sympathy with the sanctuary movement. I have also always opposed the Reagan-Bush effort to support the homegrown Caballero Juntas to the south and to overthrow progressive reform governments like the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Indeed, I have long supported the U.S. Solidarity Movement's attempt to aid and abet reform and revolutionary movements in Central America. I think we need to disband the CIA and prohibit other U.S. government agencies from covert or overt military intervention in the Third World. I am convinced that there will be no land reform, no democracy, and no end to repression and death squads without the Latin American middle class, rural campesinos, and urban intellectuals uniting in disgust and affecting true reform through revolutions such as that which toppled Somoza in Nicaragua. Nonetheless, I still have honest questions about whether, by sticking to the liberal dogma about unlimited immigration, we might actually be postponing revolutions or effective democratic reform movements in Latin America. This is one of the potential costs of having our nation serve as an overflow valve for Latin America's unruly angry economically dispossessed, and politically active citizens, to say nothing of the ecological impact.
while Ed Abbey's proposal to send every illegal refugee that is caught home with a rifle and a thousand rounds of ammunition may be considered flippant and impractical, its underlying spirit has some merit that liberals and far too many leftists ignore. So while I apologize for how my views on illegal immigration may have been stated in the Simple Living interview, I cannot rid myself of my nagging questions about unlimited immigration. Despite all my sympathies and affections for the oppressed people of Mexico and Central America, despite my distaste for artificial national borders, despite my antipathy for the Border Patrol, I cannot convince myself that unlimited immigration from Latin America, or from anywhere else for that matter, will fundamentally solve problems either here or there. A little troll in the back of my brain keeps whispering nagging questions. Who is really being helped by unlimited immigration? Is it sustainable? Does it actually exacerbate social and ecological problems here and in Latin America? What are effective and humane solutions for the real and underlying problems in this tragic situation? Similarly I have serious doubts and nagging questions about conventional humanitarian foreign aid responses to the increasing problem of famine in the third world. That is what I was trying to get at in my comments on famine in Ethiopia. In my oft-quoted remark about famine in Ethiopia, however, I failed to clearly make this point. Indeed, I implied through my sloppy, off-the-cuff remark that famine was purely a biological question of too many people and too few resources, completely unrelated to social organization, economic exploitation, or international relations. I also implied that the best possible social response was for us to do nothing, offer no assistance of any kind, and to just let the hungry starve. I very much regret the way I phrased these comments. Standing by themselves, out of context, they sound truly cold-hearted. The point I was trying to make, and which I think is made when the rest of the interview is taken into account, is that oftentimes a feel-good humanitarian response from the United States or Western Europe may not have the result we hope and may even have the opposite result. The problem of famine has a number of important causes which can and should be addressed by insightful, creative actions on the part of social movements in the United States and by the rest of the first world. There is undoubtedly a positive role that we can play even though the answers are not often clear to me and the problem is very complex and entrenched. I still have honest questions about the much-admired relief effort during the Ethiopian famine of the mid-1980s. I think these questions desperately need to be explored. Did shipping food to Ethiopia actually alleviate suffering? Does such aid, at its best, ever do more than stave off abject starvation for a short time, while leaving the underlying problems untouched? What is the lot of those poor wretches kept alive by the food shipments in 1985 to 86? Did most survive with their bodies and minds intact or are they permanently disabled or handicapped? If the latter, will these unfortunates be an impossible burden preventing Ethiopia from dealing with its problems? These are terrible and hard questions I know, but I think we have to at least consider them given that another famine lurks on the horizon of that increasingly desert-like land. We need to carefully analyze the on-the-ground results of this very sincere and sometimes heroic relief effort. From what I have read, it appears that very little was accomplished and that the Ethiopian military junta used the food supplies as a political weapon to favor those who supported the central government and to punish those who supported the rebels in the civil war. Is it implausible then to argue that the principal beneficiaries of the Ethiopian relief effort, besides the military junta, were the contributors to it in the West, who derived liberal, do good or satisfaction without having to confront the massive inequities between the first and third worlds or question the economic imperialism of transnational corporations and financial institutions like the World Bank or change their own excessively consumptive lifestyles. I think it can be persuasively argued that such uncritical, one-shot relief efforts actually inhibit a well-thought-out, long-term aid program to help native agriculturalists get back on their feet with tools and crops suitable for their particular ecological conditions and social needs. Indeed, it has to be asked, and I admit it is a terrible question, if such last-minute relief efforts actually allow a human population stretched beyond the land's carrying capacity to eke out existence for a few more years and, 
in the process I cause even greater deterioration of the land's capacity to support humans and other species. There is that little troll in the back of my brain again. Do such liberal, humanitarian relief efforts do more harm than good in terms of both human beings and the land? Certainly a growing number of radical social activists are aware of many of the problems I raise here. Unfortunately however, many leftists, and rightists, still posit simplistic reasons for the tragedy in places like Ethiopia due to their desire to make the strongest possible case for the particular institutional demon highlighted by their particular social ideology. They also frequently discount the ecological or biological factors that often underlie problems of famine. Please let's be realistic and admit that there are several different and interrelated demons at work fostering famine conditions and that overpopulation is one of them and has to be vigorously addressed. While I agree that the population question can be approached in narrow, racist, and fascistic ways, I strenuously reject the idea that any and all ecologically grounded concerns about human overpopulation are racist and fascist. Is it racist and fascist, for example to propose making birth control methods and devices, including the French abortion pill and sterilization, freely available to any woman or man in the world who desires them? I am unwilling to silence the heretical troll in my brain in order to be certified politically correct by conventional leftists. Yet I do see the problem of overpopulation more clearly now than I did back in 1986. I have come to understand through Murray that those of us who worry about the results of the population bomb need to make our case as carefully as possible. We need to acknowledge the many social, cultural, and economic causes of population growth as well as the biological, and we need to campaign for economic justice and an end to maldistribution of land, food, and other necessities of life as well as for the humane and long-term reduction of the human population. That's my position on population. If anyone has a bone to pick with it, fine, but please criticize it and not some five-year-old, off-the-cuff, out-of-context statement that does not accurately represent my considered opinion. Unfortunately I doubt that these careful clarifications and apologies will satisfy all of my critics. There seems to be a dogmatic, blind rage among many of my critics that renders them incapable of entering into a reasoned dialogue with me to explore our various positions and political differences together. Murray is an appreciated exception. Sadly those who shout me down at speaking engagements, loudly chanting racist or fascist at me, or who make the same vocal charges over and over again in the press, have made a straw man out of me that resembles their fantasies and fears far more than it resembles me or my positions. Even more sadly I believe these angry and uninformed hecklers are playing into the hands of FBI provocateurs. The FBI has clearly targeted me and hopes to shut me up, not just through harassment with a phony felony indictment but by using their talents at movement disruption, honed during the COINTELPRO era against the Black Panthers, Martin Luther King, Jr., and the American Indian movement, to exploit this straw man and label me a racist. Note. For a good history of the COINTELPRO program, see War Churchill and Jim Vander Waal, the COINTELPRO papers, Documents from the FBI Secret Wars Against Dissent in the United States, Boston, South End Press, 1990, for a good activist's guide to protecting your movement from such tactics, see Brian Glick, War at Home, Covered Action Against U.S. Activists and What We Can Do About It, Boston, South End Press, 1989. End note. I have frequently been written off completely by people whose sole knowledge of my political perspective is gleaned from these two short quotes of mine taken out of context from the vast amount I have said or written. I have also routinely been misquoted. And, perhaps most maddening of all, I have been smeared by guilt by association. Unfortunately it is commonly assumed by many of my critics that, because I admired Ed Abbey and was a longtime friend of his, I agree with every one of his opinions on every single topic that he ever chose to talk or write about. I have also been held responsible for every statement made in Earth First while I was its editor. Personally I would like to meet any editor of a movement publication who has always agreed with every word of every article that he or she has ever agreed to publish. This kind of guilt by association is simply absurd. 
I am aware, however, that my personal brand of deep ecology politics does represent a real heresy from some of the orthodoxies embedded within most liberal and left opinion today. The little troll in the back of my mind frequently troubles me, too. Why shouldn't the difficult questions it raises trouble others? Perhaps one of my biggest differences with Murray is that I am significantly more pessimistic about the future than he. I am not sure we really have enough time to turn things around before most of the world is overtaken by famine, genocide, war, totalitarianism, plagues, and economic collapse. When I look into the future, it is rare that I see pretty scenes of protected wilderness, prosperous farms, soft technology abundance, and smiling children. I hope for this. I work for it, but it usually seems like a long shot to me. I value my heretical little troll, however, because if we do have any real hope to turn things around it will depend on squarely facing our predicament. There is no realistic hope until enough of us have the courage to correctly identify the root problems of the ecological crisis. These root problems most certainly include social, political, and economic aspects but they also include ecological and biological realities as well. We need to rethink and rebuild our social ethics and politics along ecological lines. That's where my little troll comes in handy. Facing up to the ecological roots of our predicament means, in large part, asking difficult and troubling questions about the limited carrying capacity of the Earth's biosphere. This line of questioning is hard for people who have embraced the cornucopian myths of modern industrialism and the unending, historic march of material progress. It is particularly hard for liberals and leftists, many of whom believe that the only way to successfully overcome poverty and injustice is to exponentially expand the available economic surplus until we create a superabundant, post-scarcity society where there is little need to fight over the size of everybody's slice of the economic pie because the pie itself is so huge. The very concept of ecological scarcity and carrying capacity limits calls this whole utopian project into question. Interestingly the basic ecological notion of carrying capacity is accepted when applied to cattle or elephants by all except the most beef with rancher or the most starry-eyed animal lover. Yet, we are loath to admit that we humans are animals, too, and that carrying capacity thus applies to us in some very real ways. My repeated statements about the reality of ecological scarcity may be the most heretical thing I have to say. It may indeed be the great divide between my view and that of most of my critics on the left, and the right. Any such suggestion is immediately called Malthusian and dismissed as long discredited, pseudoscientific hogwash at best, and racist and imperialist propaganda at worst. Thomas Malthus is, of course an easy target for dismissal. His dire warnings of economic collapse and global famine in the early 19th century did not materialize as predicted. His argument that human population naturally grows at an exponential rate while food production only grows arithmetically was also simplistic. To discredit, however, Malthus was right about his general argument that human societies exist within an ecological context that presents real natural limits that human beings must either adapt to or ultimately suffer some form of social and ecological crash. The nature of our ecosystem provides many opportunities for the human species but it also presents human societies with serious biological constraints that are not of our own choosing and which can only temporarily be ignored. Unfortunately to deny this ecological reality leaves completely unchallenged the very social trends that are pushing our society to catastrophically overshoot the Earth's limited carrying capacity. Such ostrich-like ignorance will lead most likely along with other social forces, to a hellish future fraught everywhere with famine, plagues, economic collapse devastating war, genocide, and totalitarianism. To the extent that the social justice movement ignores the whole question of our overshooting the Earth's carrying capacity it inadvertently contributes to the likelihood of this future for everyone. Indeed, Malthus might be considered an optimist by the standards of the late 20th century for he only focused on the constraints that limited food supplies posed for human population growth and economic development. As ecologically minded political scientist William Ophels points out. Quote, Instead of simple Malthusian overpopulation and famine, 
we must now also worry about shortages of the vast array of energy and mineral resources necessary to keep the engines of industrial production running, about pollution and other limits of tolerance in natural systems, about such physical constraints as the laws of thermodynamics, about complex problems of planning and administration, and about a host of other factors Malthus never dreamed of. End quote. Note. William Ophel's Ecology and the Politics of Scarcity, San Francisco, W.H. Freeman, 1977, 9. End note. I strongly recommend that every environmental and social justice activist read and grapple with William Catton's Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. In his book, Catton provides the best and most informed discussion yet published on the relationship of carrying capacity to human societies. He restates Malthus' dictum in ecological terms as, quote the biotic potential of any species exceeds the carrying capacity of its habitat. End quote. Note. William Catton, Jr., Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change, Urbana, University of Illinois Press, 1980, 126. End note. Human beings are included here just as are elephants or lemmings. This book might well change how you think about the world. I agree with Native American scholar Vine Deloria, Jr., who, on the back cover of Catton's book, describes it as one of the most important books I have read in my lifetime. By itself, however, Catton's instrumental evaluation of how to live successfully within the carrying capacity limits of the biosphere is not sufficient. There are several possible ways of life that do not, on a global level, overshoot the Earth's carrying capacity. Some of these ways are moral and benefit the entire community and others do not. A barely sustainable resource fascism is more than a speculative possibility for the future. It may well be the path of least resistance. We thus need a strong ethical foundation in order to choose what kind of ecologically sustainable society we should work toward. We need, ultimately to get clear on more than just the ecological carrying capacity constraints on our behavior. We also need to explore the ethical limitations we should adopt, in Aldo Leopold's words, on our freedom of action in the struggle for existence. Note. Aldo Leopold, a Sand County Almanac, New York, Oxford University Press, 1949, 202. End note. The libertarian left has some very good things to say about the ethical limitations on our behavior when it comes to the social relationships between members of the human community. Humanist social ethics foster a vision of society that is equitable democratic, and respectful to all members of the human community. I myself subscribe to much of this ethical vision as far as it goes. However, it is very limited. Unfortunately the vast majority of the left, even the environmentally oriented left, has next to nothing to say about environmental ethics beyond an ultimately anthropocentric commitment to provide a sustainable non-toxic, and aesthetically pleasing environment for all human beings. To me, this leftist anthropocentrism represents a huge failure of moral imagination and will ultimately lead, if successful, to a world where big wilderness and a significant degree of biodiversity are lost forever. Everything inside me rebels against this callous, morally impoverished view. I believe a grizzly bear snuffling along Pelican Creek in Yellowstone National Park with her two cubs has just as much natural right to her life as any human has to his or hers. All living things have intrinsic value, inherent worth. Their value is not determined by what they will ring up on the cash register of the GNP, nor by whether or not they are aesthetically pleasing to human beings. They just are. They have traveled that same three and a half billion year evolutionary course we have. They live for themselves, for their own sakes, regardless of any real or imagined value to human civilization. They should never be considered mere means to our ends for they are, like us, also ends in themselves. If I were to suggest only one book for people to read on environmental ethics, it would be Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac. Aldo Leopold perhaps thought harder about nature and our relationship to it than anyone else in 20th century America. 
forest supervisor, game manager, pioneer ecologist, and university professor, Leopold was always on the cutting edge of conservation. His posthumously published almanac ranks among the finest discussions of environmental ethics ever written. In fact, for my money it is the most important, the loveliest, the wisest book ever penned. He has made thousands of people into heretics and frankly the times call for a generous dose of radical ecological heresy. I believe that the intrinsic value of living things demands direct moral consideration in how we organize our societies. I reject anthropocentrism completely and argue that besides our social commitments we also need to honor direct moral duties to the larger ecological community to which we belong. We have a moral obligation to preserve wilderness and biodiversity to develop a respectful and symbiotic relationship with that portion of the biosphere that we do inhabit, and to cause no unnecessary harm to non-human life. Furthermore, I believe that these moral obligations frequently supersede the self-interests of humanity. Human well-being is vitally important to me, but it is not the ultimate ethical value. I agree with Aldo Leopold that ultimately a thing is right when it tends to enhance the integrity stability, and beauty of the biotic community. Note. Ebedum, 224-225. End note. For social ethics to be ecologically grounded they must become consistent with this larger ecological moral imperative. That is why I am for Earth first. Such an ecological sensibility is surely radical but it is far from new. It has been, in one form or another, a common feature of the philosophical outlook of most primal peoples throughout history. It has, however, just begun to gain significant ground among citizens of the industrialized nations. For many it is a shocking departure from what they were brought up to believe. Right now, the whole field of environmental ethics is exploding as more and more people try to flesh out an almost intuitive non-anthropocentric orientation into a well-reasoned, usable ethic to guide human interaction with the rest of the natural world. I dub my tentative attempts biocentrism, others like Warwick Fox describe their approach as ecocentrism. Murray Bookchin describes his approach as the ethics of complementarity, there is, of course much overlap between these various non-anthropocentric perspectives. There are also some serious disagreements about what constitutes a morally appropriate relationship between humanity and the rest of the natural world that deserve further discussion. Indeed, there are significant differences even among those who call themselves biocentrics. Philosopher Paul Taylor, for example has written an elaborate treatise on the biocentric outlook on nature and, while I appreciate his effort, I take exception to much of his approach. Note. For a full presentation of Taylor's interpretation of the biocentric outlook, see Paul Taylor, Respect for Nature, A Theory of Environmental Ethics, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1986. End note. Biocentrism is hardly a monolithic perspective. Clearly the search for Earth wisdom has just begun for most of us. Arne Ness has noted that there are three fairly distinct tendencies within the deep, long-range, ecology movement, the naturals, the spirituals, and the socials. Note. Arne Ness finding common ground, 9. End note. I am by temperament a natural. My primary concern is conservation biology and the defense of the wild. However, politically I have been drawn over time into an increasing appreciation of the socials who focus primarily on fundamentally reconstructing human society along socially and ecologically non-hierarchical lines. Such an approach is surely needed if we are to resolve the overarching ecological crisis which is shaking our planet. On my best days, I seek a creative synthesis of all of these approaches into an integrated and coherent perspective which can guide our movement even as radical ecology activists continue to specialize in their particular areas of interest. That is why I am proud to have taken part in this dialogue with Murray Bookchin, one of the pioneers of social ecology. My fear, however, is that this synthesis will not ultimately take firm root and that one of these three tendencies will simply become so dominant that the vital contributions of the other perspectives will be minimized or lost. This concerns me because I believe it would weaken the larger movement even more than our current fractured condition, 
where all of the limited approaches are at least alive and well. I thus think that the most responsible stance for anyone in any of these tendencies is to assume that their approach is both valid and limited. We need to be open to the criticisms of others in order to sharpen our own perspectives. We also need to be willing to sharpen the perspective of other wings of the movement through adding our own constructive criticisms to the ongoing dialogue and debate. And we must be tolerant and respectful of individuals with whom we may differ in this discussion. How can we create a human society that is tolerant and respectful of individuals if we cannot create a movement in which we are tolerant and respectful of individuals with whom we disagree? My biggest worry about the limited perspective of a socially oriented ecology is that it can all too easily become overwhelmingly social and insufficiently ecological. I see this tendency among many social ecologists when they argue that we should work to reharmonize humanity with nature by reharmonizing the social relationships between human and human. Note. Principles of Social Ecology from the Institute for Social Ecology's 1991 Summer Program Catalog. End note. This strategic axiom appears to emphasize the traditional social concerns of the libertarian left over direct day-to-day -day struggles to defend wilderness, foster an ecological sensibility or reconstruct our society's interaction with the rest of the natural world here and now. The view here seems to be that, once the social relationships between human beings are all resolved, an ecological sensibility will automatically flower, and appropriate ecological changes in our society's relationship to nature will be made. Certainly not all social ecologists are under this illusion that our ecological problems can all wait to be resolved until after a libertarian, democratic social revolution is successful. Many if not most, clearly realize that we don't have this luxury even if we want it. To his credit, Murray has explicitly and repeatedly expressed the need for organizing around both social and ecological questions in the here and now. Yet the way this social ecology slogan is formulated and frequently repeated by a variety of social ecology groups does suggest a subtle tendency among many socially oriented ecologists to devalue the validity of the important, though admittedly limited, activities of the naturals. Indeed, I suspect it represents a holdover from the anthropocentric perspective that is still so common among leftists and social justice activists. Ironically such a tendency can even be seen today within Earth First, once a stronghold of non-anthropocentric naturals. I have become increasingly uncomfortable with the influx of new people into Earth First who seem more adapted to a traditional social and economic justice worldview than to a radical ecological one. These new activists seem to be drawn to the organization primarily because of its media exposure and our reputation for confrontational, kick-ass direct action. Frankly I worry that rather than reflecting a process of creative synthesis, this evolution represents a subtle but increasing disregard for the valid insights of the early naturals who originally built Earth First. Mind you, these differences between the old and new guard in Earth First are, for the most part, honest differences between decent people who respect one another. Furthermore, I feel that much vital and important work remains to be done by the most recent incarnation of Earth First. Yet, given my perspective as an uncompromising, wilderness-loving natural, I feel the need to work within a new organization explicitly committed to biocentrism and doggedly focused on ecological wilderness identification, preservation, and restoration. For this reason, I've left Earth first and begun to explore with others the possibilities of starting a new organization along these lines. Hopefully this new organization will complement the work of the many and varied groups in the conservation movement as well as provide a continuing clear voice for the naturals within the larger radical ecology movement as we all labor together to find a common, integrated perspective that overcomes the limitations of each radical ecological tendency while maintaining the vital insights of each.